one. Hey, hi, everybody. Hey, I made it on time. Seven o'clock. I got my good friend and guest and top level guy from the Midwest, Arizona, Dr. Aaron Witten. We're going to talk about him in a second, but I'm going to go over my little tiny diatribe as I always do. How is everybody? Uh, we're going to talk about uh, getting around injuries tonight. I think I put that in the title. If you got shoulder pain, uh, back pain, neck pain, knee pain, all that stuff that usually encroaches upon you as you go through life, invariably, uh, there's always a way to get around it and still train and make great results. You're just going to do things in a little bit of a different way. But really, when we talk about longevity and uh, aging well without getting old, you got to ask yourself, are you a public success while being a private failure? I was for a long time when I had my clinic many years ago. And believe me, I don't want medals on my chest, but I worked so hard, so long, uh, so fervently without a break. And I was still training, but that was more of a heartless pantomime. Uh, uh, avoiding happiness, because I thought happiness would uh, make me weaker and less successful. So these crazy, crazy thought processes that I thought if I were outworked everyone and outworked even myself, I'd be guaranteed success. Well, uh, yeah, on the outside, I looked great. Uh, I had a nice place to live, nice cars, clothes, trips, restaurants, all that stuff. The accoutrements of destroying myself. Uh, so there was a um, misalignment there. And I think a lot, a lot, a lot of people have that. And I like to use the terms structures become shackles. You are, um, uh, you are ruled by the things that you buy that are extraneous to you that you think are more important than you. Well, I finally got away from that, and Dr. Witten, we were talking beforehand, he agrees, the, the, the self, the soma, uh, the person, the ego, whatever you want to call it, has to come first. You've got to fortify yourself to the point of being selfish. Uh, and our goal is to impact as many people as possible. So that's just what we do. And Martin Luther King said it himself, again, if... You're doing all these things every single day and you're not helping anybody what good is anything why are you even doing it so dr witten i just want to talk a little bit about him i've got some notes i really don't have to go buy them but just for the sake of completeness you know dr witten started as a young young guy he's younger than me because the longer you're on this earth uh the less people there are ahead of you there's more young people behind you you're gonna be 46 in july correct okay yep. i'm 56 so we've got a dime uh, separating us 10 years, but we're still, I think, you know, both, both in great shape. I think if you were to write in a chart, if you were my patient, I would say patient appears much younger than his stated age. And that's part of health. You know, we, we you know, people say, oh, what do you mean? You're talking about how a person looks. Well, how, you know, listen, how do you project is part of good health. And don't tell me you don't want to look good. So that's part of it. But that's not what we put first. Uh, so Dr. Witten started as a young guy. Um, he was slight of build, very small. Uh, and he was even losing arm wrestling contests to females, so we couldn't have that. And he ended up working in a grocery. He found a, a muscle magazine with Lou Ferrigno on the cover. He uh, commandeered the family car at age 15 illegally to go to the gym. But his father was okay with this because he was destroying the basement with his uh, makeshift stuff down there, as we all did at one time. Uh, and he found the best looking guy, the best looking bodybuilder. He watched what he did, and then he did finally approach him. And the guy, he saw the interest, he saw the potential, he saw the fact that there was a young guy in there not screwing around outside and he wanted to do something constructive. And he said, If you do exactly what I tell you to do, you can be a successful bodybuilder. And shortly thereafter, Aaron won his first show at 16. Now, a guy like me, it took eight years to get a trophy and 15 years to win a show. So, I you know, again, if you keep going, you're gonna you're gonna achieve it, and you're you're going to succeed. But then he had a long, uh, successful career of bodybuilding, still in top top shape. Also, as a power athlete, uh, became a naturopathic physician, uh, and now he uh, focuses mostly on telemedicine, especially with the um, uh, works in a clinic uh, that's in a fitness facility. Uh, but with the pandemic right now. Uh, he's been forced into working more from home, but it's working even better because that's how his business is set up. And it helps a lot, a lot of people. And it, his special, I don't know if it's a specialty, but when we talk, I get the most out of him. When we're talking about, um, like I get people over 50, and, uh, and I'm going to introduce you in one second. And you're going to do most of the talking, Aaron, believe it or not. But I got to just get this out. Um, 
Uh, and, and a lot of the people, a lot of the patients and clients, they wonder why all I do is talk about injury. Like, Doc, I want to start. I can't wait to start. I'm like, listen, you're 52. If you blow your knee out or blow your back out, you will never come back here. You will never get in shape. Listen, because I, how do I know this? Because we have to go with what we have right now, and that's what happens all the time. So we've got to be plotting and methodical, have some strategy. What is your goal? What does your physicality allow you to do? You can be better than you were in a different way. And, and Dr. Witten is very good at this as far as getting around the back uh, injury, the knee injury, the decrepit shoulder, uh, the degeneration in the neck. And everybody can still succeed, but there is not a lot of negotiation with science when it comes to him. Uh, so he lays down the rules. Aaron, how are you, man? Thanks for being uh, with me. Yeah, uh, well, thank you for having me. Oh, no, man, on a Friday night, because everybody's, well, you know, ordinarily we wouldn't do this because Facebook on Fridays and Saturdays, there's no traffic and people are out screwing around Friday night, but now everybody's home. So, you know, we'll get some play. We'll get some traffic. But either way, they can watch this later on. We'll put it on your timeline as well. Um, how's everything going out there in Arizona? You know, you're, 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 uh, everything's closed down. When, when are things opening up as far as what they're telling you? Uh, we're going to be up and running in terms of the, the gyms uh, early next week. So preparations are being made. Is it true that um, you're going to have to wipe down each machine and each dumbbell after using them? You know, that's the issue is that the, the health department hasn't really issued concrete uh, protocol yet. So we're, we're we're kind of wringing our hands and, and waiting to see the extent of it. I've, I've spoken to some gyms that are requesting you wear gloves and a mask. That's not going to happen. Uh, and then others are kind of ignoring everything and just returning to business as usual. Uh, obviously, we're going to need to meet in the middle a little bit. Would you agree? We're, we, and we don't get into politics or any pissing contests. You know, listen, all will be well. You know, if you could uh, project yourself, you know, a year later, you visit that nice, comfortable space in your head where you want to get to. But don't you think everybody's staying in? It's not helping your immunity very much. No, absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, it's just like your musculoskeletal system, use it or lose it. So uh, when you're at home in a sterile environment or, or nearly, the, the immune system downregulates. You know, we're supposed to be exposed to pathogens regularly. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about um, sarcopenia, too, in a bit. You know, when you mention, you know, the musculoskeletal system and males losing losing the muscle, that mysterious. I see all your trophies in the background. Represent. I got one. <laughs> I got one. I don't know. They're, you know, it's that, that old thing. They're all at home coat hangers now in my parents' basement. But, you know, the first one I'm really happy I have it was given to me by Mike Katz. You know, they made a mistake. They called me out as first place, and I was solidly third. Uh, and I went out there like I was a winner, and the whole place was quiet. This was in the 70s when there was no music. So when I hold that trophy, I'm like, well, oh, dude, I'm harsh. Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> one, of those, you know, one of those things you still think back to when you still get embarrassed like 40 years later. You know? There's some deep meaning there. I, no, I, I, you know, listen, <laughs> I kept going. Uh, you won your first show. We were talking earlier when we were discussing, you know, our, our pre-show. I said, you know, Aaron, you, you know, you won your first show. And I see that happen with guys sometimes. And it kind of it, it kind of de-ignites them uh, as far as their enthusiasm. And they quit. But but you kept – what made you keep going on? I mean, that's your temperament in life, right, the way you pursue things. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've been exposed to, uh, to folks who've excelled in their field – uh, throughout my life, I've been lucky to have have those experiences. So uh, I've been at the bottom of the ranks in different endeavors and had to fight my way up prior uh, to this. So uh, that kind of guided me and gave me the, the the foresight, if you will, for longevity's sake. And it also kept me humble enough to know that I wasn't going to win the Olympia next year or anything ludicrous like that. <laughs> you, you learn, listen, you learn that, you, you know, I was talking to Evan Santapani. I tell the story all the time. And, you know, Evan's a nice, nice, great guy, really smart. And, but, but, you know, we're talking and, uh, you know, he's 300 pounds. And uh, he said, look, Mike, I was about, he's 30. I think he just turned 37. But uh, he said, look, I was about this size when I was 20. I already knew, you know, I had, and, you know, Jay Cutler was like that too. He was already, yep. you know, he didn't have the refinement, you know, the detail, you know, the, 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 the density which you develop over time. So, you know, pretty, pretty, like, didn't you stand next to Kai Green in a show and you're like, hum, there's a difference here, right? 
Oh yeah, yeah. You know, when, when did that happen? And what what was your impression and your thoughts after that? Oh my God! Well, that was a an old NGA show. I've competed in, I think, just about every organization over the years. That's, uh, Andy, that's Andy Bustinto's. Uh, you got it. I know Andy. You got it. Yeah, he yeah, was a good guy. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I like Andy. <laughs> Uh, so we're all of similar caliber except for Kai. And, uh, you know, when people, uh, claim that, that he was natural at that time, I, I absolutely believe it. Yeah. The structure was there. The shape was, these things cannot be developed from, you know, drug usage. No. Uh, he had the, he had the potential from the start and he made us look like the amateurs we were. <laughs> <laughs> did, you take, you know, did you take second there? You know, I honestly, Mike, I can't remember. That's well, because, because Aaron, I'm going to speak for you. You're you're a damn good competitor. You are. Right. You're a quiet guy. You keep your head down. You, you do your work. You know, you're the type of person that makes America great. You know, and um, and it, so you can always count on me to to sing your your plaudits. You know, we need guys like you. But we, I just want to mention, we have Jim Nake is here right now, uh, Dr. Chiropractor uh -huh. mine, uh, from Chicago. He's opening his third longevity clinic. Really good guy. And I don't remember this, but when I was in Cairo school 30 years ago, he said I helped him with a contest, going in a contest. And um, and I'm helping him now, ironically, 30 years later. He's fallen off the track a little bit. He's lost 30 pounds. You know, telemedicine, you know, I'm doing it over the Internet. We talk once a week. and But he's doing all the work. You know, he's. He's hammering our way. He's, uh, you know, he's preparing his food. He's got three clinics he's managing. He's got, you know, two young kids, you know, wife, big house, all that, and he's doing it. So it's not the fact that he might have a little more money to spend on food. You know, there's plenty of people like that, and they still can't do it. He makes the time. He gets up earlier. And you know, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm proud of him because that's very. I don't like that. You know, I'm, I'm not his father. I'm not proud of him. But you know, he's, he's representing, and he's. Uh, you know, he's doing what he has to do because the time is now. And, and I think by September, he'll be down to two and a quarter. He's changing his life. You know, getting back to where he has to be. And he joined us tonight. So I just wanted to thank him for doing that. Getting back to you, uh, you ran your course through bodybuilding and you ended up going in the universe, right? I did, uh, yeah. That was the last show you did. Uh, I did one more show uh, in 2015 to assist a, a promoter primarily, uh, who's a friend of mine, uh, he was introducing the new classic physique division. And I, I just, I think the world of that, I, I really, I really like that new division. Um, and he asked if I'd be a part of it. And so I jumped in and did pretty poorly because I don't have <laughs> classic physique. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what does oh, that, uh, let me ask you, what does that mean? What does that mean? Classic physique? Really? What does it mean? Well, you know what? In some ways, it's more uh, genetically predetermined than the open class. Uh, so guys, guys want to get into the classic because they say, oh, I don't have the potential to get big enough for the open. But you've got to have a lot of attributes to be a successful classic physique guy. You know, you've got to have the wide uh, clavicles. You know, you've got to have the narrow waistline, things like this that cannot be developed. You have to be gifted from birth to a large extent. Uh, and like like most, I do not have those qualities. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, I train over here, you know, East Coast Mecca, Montanari's powerhouse, and I pop the pictures up. I pop a lot of pictures up. And um, uh, Sadiq uh, uh, Hadzovic, very very good. Yeah. Like he, won the, he won the first Arnold physique, I think. But let me tell you something. You stand next to these guys and you see them; they're big. Because I'm not, I'm yeah. not. Well, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm in my fifties now and I'm pretty well developed, you know, 190. Uh, and if I'm standing next to a normal guy, you know, it's night and day, but I stand with Sadiq. It's, it's a big, but you know, just like you said, he's got this natural small waist, you know, his thighs flare out, the shoulders, you know, you either have that or you don't, you know, yeah. you, you could pull this Bengali stuff where you're putting your position in your body. It's not going to do it. So you, no. you tried to help him out, and 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 he did that, and you know I was at yeah a I got in great shape. It, it was a it was a challenge for me. I had a lot going on personally and professionally at the time, and I wanted to see if I could pull it off. Uh, so it was really just a selfish endeavor, you know, in that aspect because I I wanted to see what I had in me left, you know. Right. Uh, so, you're like you're like Stallone from Rocky Six when he's talking to Paulie, and Paulie's back to processing meat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
doing? You're fighting this young guy. And he, he's like, well, yeah, I got a little left in the basement, you know, or something. Yeah. Like that, you know? Yeah, I had a blast trainer for that show. There was no pressure. I, I wasn't trying to climb the competitive ladder. You know, I didn't care about my placement. I, people say that and they're usually full of shit, but I, I truly did not because I, in my mind, I was still retired competitively. Right. This was about getting myself into peak condition. I wanted to see what I could really do and, and improve upon my prior form. And that was a great success. So, and, you know, I had a great time doing it. Uh, so speaking of your prior form, let me ask you this. I think I know the answer. How far afield do you deviate from contest condition? Uh, when I don't even like to say off season because you know we're always you're always you're always active. You know off season. What does that mean? I don't understand. Right. But do you do you gain ten pounds? Do you do you lose all your cuts or, or uh, what kind of uh, um, what do you follow as far as <laughs> well, you, you, guys like us that have attained true contest level conditioning know what that means and represents, right? So. Yeah. There's a huge difference between looking good in the gym and being stage ready. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and what I'm getting at is a lot of guys see me in the off season and they go, Oh my God, you're ready for a contest. Why do you stay so lean? And I just have to laugh to myself because I know that that's bullshit that I'm, I'm a long way off. Now the scale may not say that much, you know, 10 pounds, 12 pounds, whatever, but I know what it takes to, to get that, that degree of conditioning. I will tell you this, listen, and you know this, because I think one of your hallmarks is, you know, extreme definition and very good balance, proportion, not symmetry. Nobody, hey, listen, anybody listening, there is no symmetry. Stop saying symmetry. Symmetry means you cut me down like this and there's two mirror images. It can't happen. Proportion, everything is balanced, flows nice. The hardest thing to do is to go on stage with very good lighting, take all your clothes off mostly, throw a pose and hope people clap. You're impressing enough to, for people. And the condition you got to get in, you know, the show and anatomy, because I'm not a big guy either. I had to get really caught to, to show all the, you know, the separation. Listen, like Romano was saying, you have to reach this depth of suffering that uh, borders on ill health. And we're yep. physicians, so I don't know if we should be propagating that, right? I mean, what do you think of that? Oh, it's a very unhealthy uh, sport when taken to that extreme. <laughs> and, you know, it makes you chuckle when people say natural bodybuilding is healthy and the way to go. Get the hell out of here. There's no such thing as healthy when you're stage ready. Would you agree with John Romano last week? He was saying, and he said this in the past, and I asked him to reiterate. He said there is no natural bodybuilding. And he wasn't necessarily talking about drugs. He said, what is natural about bodybuilding you know right the, the seven meals a day the tanning the shaving the pummeling of the flesh in the gym uh the social isolation you know all the others any you know, other you want to mix in the drugs uh, so is there natural bodybuilding no. i don't know i have a problem with that when people even use that term you know no i, I heard him say that and i i was just uh i was really very much in agreement because i'm a student of history to preface this. So I, I know what early man looked like, primitive man, and people often, you know, they, they have this image of uh, cavemen being lean and ripped and muscular. Yeah. That's bullshit. No. The human body uh, desires to carry the least amount of mass possible, the most fat possible. Right. Uh, it's, there's no survival natural mode. state. Yeah, it, the human body wants to do one thing, survive and procreate. Uh, so it makes no sense to carry around 50 pounds of extra tissue that's largely useless right. and requiring a, a ton of energy to maintain. Uh, so natural bodybuilding is a misnomer at least. What was the best, what would you say uh, as far as the physiques, what was the best era? You know, if you're looking at, you know, John Grimmick and then Steve Reeves and then, you know, then you had, um, you know, Bill Pearl in the 60s, and then you had Dave Draper and Arnold in the 70s, and then you had 80s with Rich Gaspari, then 90s, um, uh, Yates, and, and so on and so forth. What What do you think was the best as far as how you define bodybuilding? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm biased due to nostalgia. I think that uh, whatever era you live through, uh, you, you tend to prefer, right? The best, yeah. So had I lived... Uh, and competed during Arnold's era, I'm sure that that would be foremost in my mind. Uh, but the, the late 80s, early 90s, 
uh, prior to Dorian, you know, the Haney years. Yeah. My God, the quality. You know, any one of those guys uh, in the top 10 or 15 at the Olympia could have been Mr. O on a yeah. given day. Yeah. You know, they were that good. And they were all unique. Right. You know, if you're comparing a Bertel Fox to a Zane or, you know, just going down the list, everybody was their own man. And now, uh, you know, I think that they've gotten away from the silhouettes behind the curtain that used to uh, start the show. You remember that back in the day? Oh, yeah. Well, that wouldn't mean anything now. No. I've got one of these magazines from the 70s. I've got a big box of them over here. Just like you said, and this portrays, I think, the 77 Olympia where they came out on the stage and they were they posed in a silhouette. Yeah. You could, tell, you could tell that's Zane. Hey, man, that's corny. Oh, that's Boyer Co. You know, because they had these signature. And I think because it's a cookbook approach, and again, I'm not, I respectfully, but this is what they do, this cookbook approach of the diet and the training, the oxygen gym and the drug, you know, protocol. You know, everybody kind of looks the same. It's re it's very yeah. weird. You know? It is, but I, I've given it a bit of thought, and I think that as much as anything, the the factor most contributing is just the the degree of mass. When you when you inflate your proportions to that extent, you're going to lose a lot of shape. You're just going to become a mass. Right. So I wonder. Well, I I can tell you with with some accuracy what what they would look like. Uh, without that that level of mass, uh, you could look at Ronnie Coleman uh, early in his career. Compare that. Compare uh, you know ninety seven to two thousand seven or, or somewhere in that range, right? Uh, <clears throat> so you, there are examples of what the guys look like prior to putting on that degree of size, and there's no doubt that there's a, a radical change in in shape and in that silhouette. So I think it's just size, man. Yeah. Uh, I, I I do think so too, and that's why they're leaning back towards uh you know like you were saying physique, and um, you know those other divisions board shorts. I mean I don't care whether yeah. you train your legs or not, you know just stick to it what it is as far as what you define as far as what you do. So you were also a power athlete as well. You, yeah. You, uh, was that Olympic lifting or power lifting? No power lifting. I I was not exposed to Olympic lifting. I have a, a tremendous amount of respect for it, uh, but by the time I uh, by the time there was coaching available, I was too beat up. Really, so I have some pretty damn healthy shoulders and knees. Can you can you give us an accounting of what that means as far as being beat up? Like maybe go head to toe. What do you got going on? These people are interested. You still you're still in fantastic shape. Yeah, uh, you you know you're a doctor, teacher, and scholar. There was a lot in translations, and that's what you do. Uh, but you, so you got to get around these things. You don't stop. You know, no. So what what are you yeah. dealing with as far as uh? you know, the injuries? Well, it's uh, it's a bit of a laundry list. Uh, a lot of it's due to fighting more than, than weight training, but there's a fair fair mix in there. When you say fighting, was that the martial arts? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you were really, you were, you were going into meets and whatnot. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was uh, uh, rated in the professional karate league and I, oh. yeah, so uh, definitely got some background there and, and similar. Can't, can't you, can't you dial up your friend, um, Chuck Norris so he can take care of this virus for us? <laughs> you got to put out, I, I some gotta put out some lines for us, man. You got to know somebody. <laughs> I doubt he's noticed it. I don't think it's even on his radar. It's not serious enough for him. No, 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 no. <laughs> he's probably eating that up like hot butter corn. All yeah. right. So you, got, so you got some, so, I mean, was, was it like a, have you, you know, forgive my, uh, my, my naivety or ignorance, but did you have, was it one of those things, strike the leg, like in Karate Kid? Is, is, is that how you get injured in, uh, I mean, literally yeah. injured during, or is it just like a wear down type of thing with, with martial arts? No, it's more acute in nature. You know, the, the, the injuries are typically, you know, a one-off, but uh, anybody that, that's been involved in, in any sort of fighting, whether it's barroom brawling or or grappling or boxing, anything will tell you that there is really no winner because you will get hurt. Fighting is a is a highly variable situation. You cannot predict all outcomes. And even if you succeed and are able to best your opponent, you're going to get banged up in the process. So some of the things that happen aren't necessarily a result of your opponent striking you. It's just uh, high tension, high force, explosive movements, 
in various planes of movement that are unpredictable and shit happens on a regular basis. In, 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 in summation, in, in tying up your background, we're looking at martial arts, power, uh, you know, power training, uh, for want of a better description. Was it powerlifting? It was yeah. powerlifting, right? And yeah. bodybuilding. Which do you prefer out of the three? Well, I, I figured that would be hard for you to, to decide on that. Yeah, from a, a sheer competitive standpoint, it would be powerlifting. Uh, and were, you, were you telling me in a private message that, that those guys are lot to get along a lot better for some reason? Oh, man, no comparison, you know? Why is that? Well, it, attack, it attracts more of a blue-collar uh, person who's more down-to-earth and real. And of course, I, I, don't, I don't deal in absolutes. I mean, there's, there's people from all walks of life. But in general, you have folks that are uh, more salt of the earth involved, and you have to rely upon each other for safety in that game. So that, there's an inherent uh, degree of camaraderie when you have to trust one another, right? Yes. And I, I just, I like the mentality. It appeals to me. I like, I like people that are honest, they're hardworking, they're down to earth, instead of the opposite, which is somebody who is uh, surrounding themselves with a facade to make themselves appear more than they are. And you, you can just, you can detect bullshit, right? Especially as you get older. You know, you know Frank Zane sent me to, a, you know, to drop names. You want me to cover a contest? And uh, he used to have a quarterly magazine. It was great. And he just recently stopped it. I, 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 I was a subscriber for the whole time. Oh, yeah. Uh, building the body. Building the body. And yeah, what a great job he did right out of his house, like a little smaller. I don't have any right here. But he wanted me to write a couple articles. So I covered a contest. And this ties into the powerlifters versus bodybuilders. And um, the kid who won, I'm standing at the door. I wanted to interview him for the magazine. And he's walking in physique guy, young kid. He's with his parents. And he walks by me and I say, hey, you look really good. And he looks at me, he goes, Psh, like that. So, you know, the father comes up to me you know, later on and he goes, I'm sorry about my son. I'm like, yeah, well, you know what? Uh, I'm here to write the articles for the show and I don't yeah. care for Olympia. I, I put character first. Tell your son that because he's he's doing the old, you know, uh, you know, yeah. You know uh, yeah, one of those things, you know, to the wrong guy. You never know who you're talking to. Be nice to everybody. And you know, you don't, you know, when I started in bodybuilding, yeah, everybody was friendly and you know, help you out with the oil. I last time I competed, I was 40, it was 2003. Nobody would talk to each other. Right. And I, I've been out of the loop and I'm like, man, this this really sucked. Good thing I was doing it for myself. But you're backstage and they're they're in their little groups and uh what what do you think? You're 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 up for the, like winning the Hope Diamond or something? I mean, come right. on, just a day, have fun, you know? Yeah. You're not Arnold. This is not, listen, Arnold already did it. It's too late. This is no longer fertile ground. It's not new anymore. You know what right. I mean? <laughs> yeah, I think it. I think it boils down to insecurity. Uh, guys want to hide everything. Uh, literally, you know, they stay covered up, and uh, you know they don't want to uh, display anything. Whereas with with powerlifting, it's more on your sleeve. You know. You, you know your numbers, you're going to display them publicly, and you can't bullshit anybody. Right. So, and there is always somebody better. That The interesting thing about powerlifting as a sport is that those lifts were chosen for specific reasons, namely uh, getting into some of our earlier discussions of uh, biomechanics and leverage. Not No one person can be uh, efficient or advantageous in all three lifts. It's impossible from a leverage standpoint. Well, no, no, let me, let me stop you for a second. In other words, they can't reign supreme in all three lifts. Right. There's no right. way. No, because, for instance, on the bench press, obviously short arms are an advantage, right? Right. They're, uh, they're a detriment to the deadlift. Shorter yeah. arms. Oh, yeah. I see. I see. I got and conversely, it. If, you can, if you can pull the moon, uh, you probably can't bench worth the damn What's the, be what's the best combination then, would you say? Because there's got to be some kind of combination to pull the, the, the best numbers. I would say probably Eddie Cohen. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have a ton of respect for him. I think he is the greatest of all time, uh, hands down. And what, what combination of uh, traits did Eddie possess? Well, he's fairly short, but he had a large bone structure that allowed him to carry sufficient weight. 
his hands are enormous, which is a big factor, believe it or not, in simply holding onto the bar with those monster deadlifts. Uh, he's thick through the chest. His arms are fairly long, so he's a good deadlifter, but he can still bench incredibly well. And his clavicle structure is very wide, so he can distribute the load on his back, which is uh, something guys don't think about. Typically, when we think of squatting, the bar's resting just on your, your traps, right? right. If you grand on your back, that sucker is going to be covering you, you know, all the way across from a cronium cronium. So he was wide naturally. So yeah, that, that, that being said, in, in a in, in a legendary guy like Ed Cohen, everybody knows who he is. How do you compare him to the guys now? These 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 behemoths, these Levi Leviathans at the Arnold Strongman competition. Is there a comparison, or is that more of a gimmick type of lift? You know what. Uh, uh, to be completely honest, if, if I could have had the potential, the ability to do any one uh, sport in the Iron Games as a whole, it would have been strongman. I love strongman. And I competed as an amateur poorly. Um, <laughs> poorly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my, my tiny ass yeah, ain't so going to be. Self-effacement self is a very useful tool. Like my mine is I'm the best mediocre bodybuilder in the world. And people are like, well, wait a minute. Oh, okay. All right. So I'm yeah. delivering the message that I'm doing this stuff and I have some credibility, but don't worry. You could probably take me down. <laughs> you oh, yeah. know? Well, you know, the, the thing that uh, helped me to sleep at night was that uh, I always had a better time competing in strongman than the guys who won. Yeah. I, oh man, I had a blast. It, it is so fun that every event's different. There, you know, there's so many variables thrown in, and you get to move heavy shit. They've got Doc, is it, Isn't that isn't that one weight class? There, there aren't weight classes. You're just in one big class. You, you're. What do you, you, what do you, you push around 200 generally your body weight? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was heavier then uh, because I was younger and fatter. Oh, there you are. <laughs> but uh, I trained. Oh, no, I lost. I lost. No, I lost, I'm sorry. No, Doc, I lost you for a second. What's your body weight in general? I normally sit at 200. Okay. All right. Yeah. So very, uh, you know, just uh, middling, <laughs> mediocre. Let me just re let me just read a couple of these. We've got Steve Umberger, a wealth of knowledge with these guys. Aaron Witten, a tremendous bodybuilder. Thanks, fellas. I I defer to, to Dr. Witten. I I I shoot him questions all the time. Guys like Lance Stranahan. I mean, I always say I don't know a lot, but I know I know really well. But I've got really smart guys around me, Steve, that help out. And in unison, we deliver the solution, which I think is fantastic. And, and Jim, make us, uh, thanks, Mike, for the differences you're coaching. Jim, you're doing it, man. Uh, we work together. Ultimately, it's you. And Bob Geisler, a good member for a long time. Awesome guy, so much knowledge. Well, we'll see. Hopefully, we'll do no harm. We'll, we'll adhere to that idea and premise that we try to espouse. All right, so, so you did all that, and you've got some injuries now, and you're working with all kinds of patients, right? Bodybuilders, strength athletes, regular people, obviously. Sure. Can you break yeah. it into percentages as far as uh, who comes to you and who seeks you out? Uh, that'd be tough. Uh, and it kind of goes in phases, you know. Uh, this year's all messed up because the, the contest season's largely canceled. Yeah. But I, I typically see an influx in the spring of competitors who have, who have questions. Um, and then again in the fall when they, they need uh, assistance with uh, the protocol and cleaning up their act, if you follow my meaning. Uh, and then in the summer, I see uh, I see a pretty good mix of people, you know, some young athletes that are that might be off season that are that are training for something, want to you know make some improvements in downtime. And I just I just want to let me uh, address Lance Stranahan. Lance is a good friend, you know Lance. Oh yeah, Lance is Lance is the real deal, and he he's he saw back in the day, and his father uh, was really a man of renown. Lots of respect for Aaron. Extremely knowledgeable and walks the walk. Just one little big net here, Lance. Uh, Aaron and I were talking, and I and I asked him about, about the clinic because you'll always get patients or subjects or. Uh, clients whatever you want to call them and they're always going to try to negotiate you know uh, like evan was telling me that he had a client that wanted to eat soy so he came back like three days in a row asking how he could eat soy only in different ways 
he'd ask the he'd, re he'd repackage the question for the next day. So ultimately, Evan said, "Look, man, you know." He told me, "Thank God I don't need the money that bad." He had to ferret him off to some guy that will say, "Okay, soy is okay." Uh, but there's no negotiation with a guy like Aaron. He sticks to the tenets of science. It has nothing to do with, uh, you know, feelings or you know the slaughtering of bulls in Bangladesh or, or whatever. Uh, it, it only has to do with results. We, we talked about it, results, right? I mean, these yeah. people, you're doing this teleconferencing now. Soy boy. Yeah, that too. You know, like our new Batman. Did you see the new Batman? He's saying that he's not going to, he doesn't want to train. He doesn't want to look jacked. He wants to be more of a, a talker <laughs> with the village. You know, I mean, come on. Wow. I'm a comic book guy too, you know, and, and listen, yeah. this, this is blasphemy. What they're totally. doing. Stop. Totally. Stop. What are you doing? Yeah. yeah, but it's kind of representative of uh, of our society, at least with the younger age group. Yeah, uh, touch upon what you were telling me beforehand about the kids that come to you and they tell you what? I don't want to get too big. I, I've actually heard that uttered on many occasions, which still astounds me because it, it's been a very safe assumption of mine uh, for the majority of my life that young men want to get bigger and stronger regardless of their background. Right. You know, that that's why guys go to the gym, right? I mean, that, that's what you do. I would like to think so. Yeah. But we've, um, we've had a paradigm shift in, in masculinity, uh, for the worse. And there is just a, uh, a stark reduction or elimination of male role models in, in the media, you know, like, like you're saying with the, the new Batman, this kind of thing in our era, uh, you know, we grew up with Conan, you know, oh, and, yeah. and, you know, Rambo. And, and I'm yeah, working yeah. really hard on getting Stallone on here. I think I could get him, but you know, that's, you know, we'll see. Uh, Very cool. Doc, what do you, what do you foresee happening with this? Because, you know, testosterone has dropped 1% every year for 20 years. Mm. Yeah. Ooh. We're going to have a, we're gonna have a reproductive crisis uh, I keep following these sperm counts and it's precipitous, man. It's just fallen dramatically uh, within the last couple of decades. And uh, we're going to have a, a real reduction in, in the birth count going forward, especially with the, you know, the, how do I put it? Uh, typical American male, let's just say that. So something's going to need to happen. We, we've got, we've got a lot of theories on, on what's causing it. Uh, and I think that it, that it's uh, cumulative rather, rather than a singular cause. Uh, there's a number of factors, but something's going to have to be done. Or when you when you say, um, are you saying less? There'll be less people born, or a lower quality male, so to speak. Uh, the former. Uh, you know, th there's so many issues with reproductive health right now. Uh, it's a it's a big field uh, for a lot of new docs to go into. Uh, Couples cannot get pregnant. Uh, men are right. men are not producing sperm, and and then on the other end of the equation, uh, the the human body does not want to uh, procreate, does not want to form new life in a woman who is in a disease state, namely obesity. So, when you've got a gal who's fifty pounds overweight and a guy with a sperm count of less than ten million, odds ain't good. No. Let's get into that right now. Let me just read a couple of these. Jim Nakis, Dr. Jim. Kids today are happy with their skinny jeans. My kids are working out with me now. Jim kicks ass. Jim, Jim is or Jim's one of those guys you know he's not going backwards. He's gonna, it's, it's just gotta go through the motions. He's he's gonna be like a rock. Lance Stranahan, wonder if it's environmental factors that that is lowering the test, or is it the Marxist professors? And their leftist ideology, and you know we could address that. I mean, what do you what do you think of that? I, I think it's cumulative. Uh, I think there's a definite uh, chemical involvement. Uh, we're being bombarded with uh, with estrogens. I mean, that's what it boils down to. In our, in our food supply. Food, yeah. Even in the water, uh, there's a disturbing. Oh, oh yeah, man. The, uh, our water supply, uh, municipal water supplies, have a a uh, registered quantity of progesterone and estrogen from birth control pills. How there's, can they do that? But there's a lot of medications in your drinking water. People flush them. Isn't that crazy? 
Yeah, that's true. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah. You, you, you can't control that. That's, that's going to happen. And, you know, I say a solution is, you know, let's get some testosterone chemtrails going, man. You know, chemtrails, just listen, we, we've got to breach this, you know, nefarious uh, uh, this action that's going on, you know, somehow because, um, you know, a man is a man, a woman is a woman. And, and um, I don't think there should be any type of, uh, you know, lollygag or no, really. No. No ambivalence toward that. But to address Lance's question more directly, I, I would say it's primarily two factors. Uh, the first being the environmental estrogens and the second being uh, aromatization. Uh, the, the current diet, if, if you can call it that, or for the, you know, the average obese American, uh, it's full of processed foods and it's very pro-estrogenic. You've got all these inflammatory fats coming in that really spur the uh, aromatization. Doc, 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 explain inflammatory fats if you could, just in, in a general sense. Yeah, when, when you have fats that are uh, uh, biased toward your uh, omega-6s, which are more uh, pro-inflammatory, and the, the typical American diet is 20 to one now in its ratio of those inflammatory fats to the good fats, which help. Compared, compared, to, compared to what, 10 years compared, ago? Compared to the ideal, which is, uh, Worst case is three to one, one to one's even better. So when you have that that state in the body of, of constant inflammation, it's gonna affect every organ system. Uh, and it it definitely aids to the cascade of aromatization in the body. So whatever testosterone the male is naturally creating is being aromatized to estrogen. That's, that's, yeah. uh, that's calamitous. Um, we're being, yeah, we're being feminized, man. That's what I'm and, and you know, you know uh, that inflammation is nefarious. It's present in every um, uh, breakdown uh, disease process in the body, whether yeah. it's caused by it or it causes the problem. Uh, and you know, with obesity, um, you know, I was just speaking earlier on a video I did. Um, uh, you know, the government says thirty percent of the population. It's much more far afield than that it's it's got to be 60 or 70 i don't know what it's like back out in arizona what what's your general physicality out there uh i would say because these you know I, i'm in connecticut and i bust on connecticut a lot but the truth is we might have three or four months of good weather where you can be active the other eight months you're covered up in heavy clothes and you're not outside yeah. you're not burning calories I mean, right what do you what do you got out there that's a factor Oh, big, big factor. You know what? It it sucks to be fat when it's hot. You're going to oh, be. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, know? you can stay fat because you're fat. If you're fat, you're fat. You know, we're not fat yeah. shaming. Uh, we're, we're not uh, picking on anybody. We're trying to correct the problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is what it is. Ask a, a woman who's had a pregnancy over the summer. She'll tell you, my God, that was the hottest I've ever been in my life. So what I'm getting at is that we have less obesity here than the average and it is attributable to our to our weather, which is favorable. But I have seen a definite increase in the roughly 15 years that I've lived here. That's a short span of time. You know, human evolution's done in millions of years, not decades. Right, right, right. That's a very good. This point. is a, I bring that up all the time. You know, evolution yeah. is very evolution is very slow. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at the houses in New England, New England here. When, when the whoever it was that came here three or four hundred years ago, the houses, uh, the windows and the, the, the doors are pretty small because the people in general were small. They were shorter. You know, there, there wasn't a lot of food. They weren't big and fat. You know, now, uh, you know, I looked at a house a while back and I was thinking about buying it, but it was just so damn small. You know, the entryways, the windows, wow. so it was an issue. But it's interesting to look at that. Uh, because you can't, that's not how they build them now because people that's are, wild. people are, oh no, it's very interesting, but the people are very big now. And you know, we, we, we've got, we've got to go to the store tonight. We've got to go to Lowe's and we've got to go to, you know, a couple of department stores that they let us in. And I'm, you know, I do this little self study. Uh, I, you know, Denise is, you know, she's buying what we have to get, but you know, uh, I always report to her, you know, do I see anybody who's maybe practicing the Steve Reeves power walking uh, program. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. 
up as a bare minimum. Listen, I don't see anybody that looks like they're getting a sweat up outside of lifting a fork to their mouth. It's very bad. Yeah, it's definitely better here. It's definitely weather related. I'm, I'm from the Midwest originally and stark contrast, man. Uh, if I were to visit there, I would be an, an oddity, an outcast almost because, you know, it's, it's funny that, that folks back in that area refer to me as thin or skinny. Are you talking, you're talking about Connecticut? No, Arkansas, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, where I'm from, I'm sorry. Uh, we live in a, uh, a distorted reality when a five foot 10, 200 pound guy is referred to as skinny. You is know? that what they say about you? Yeah. Yeah. They don't, they don't even consider the muscularity. They just look it, at you. I, I tell you what, it, by my age, if you don't have a, an abdomen protruding past your chest, you're just an oddity. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it, it's, it's really disturbing. Uh, so we have less of that here, but like I said, it's growing. Uh, Got to be uncomfortable. I I tried to put on some weight one summer when I first moved here, and I said, the hell with that. Because you know, when you're shoveling in the calories, yeah, that's units of heat energy. And when it's 120 outside, you don't need any help. <laughs> well, well, let's let, let's look at the virus for a moment. You know, the comorbidities. Those are the people, really, you know, the obese, uh, you know, the high blood pressure, the everything that comes with the diabetes. You know, elderly, you know, those are the ones that have to really hold up. Uh, but if you're weakening, uh, you know, you're, you're isolating yourself and you're weakening yourself uh, and you're obese on top of it. I mean, you're really putting yourself at disadvantage. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The uh, obesity is a disease state, as I mentioned. So anytime the body is compromised in a disease state of any sort, uh, every other system is affected. We are a holistic organism there nothing works in a vacuum with the human body everything is affected by something else uh usually to a, a large extent and the immune system is is uh especially dependent upon the health of the whole individual because it's pervasive the immune system is not a singular organ like the rest of the, the bodily systems you know it's it's cells that are throughout the system uh so they, Doc, Doc, you, Doc, you've got a couple of questions here from a good friend, yeah. Frank Barry, who's done. He works with Mick Souza, a famous bodybuilder. Yeah. Frank says, uh, supposing you use a product to lower estrogen, such as Novadex. It says Nova Sex, but I know he means Novadex. And then he <laughs> says, then he says I, I don't know if that's a slip there, Frank. I, yeah, won't, yeah. Tell you, I won't tell your wife unless she's watching. Uh, and then he asks, lowering estrogen is supposed to allow testosterone to stay up, is it not? Uh, your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, basically it boils down to your free testosterone. So if you have less aromatization to estrogen, you're going to have more testosterone that can then be utilized as circulating free tests. So, uh, you, you know, you can either suppress the estrogen itself or uh, address the actual aromatization. So there's different routes. He, he uh, Frank says he uh, Frank looks great. He got really hard as nails, and Frank lost like a hundred pounds. He was a, you know, one of those people. You know how often you know ultimately people don't really succeed. Uh, you know Evan was even telling me anybody who embarks on a program with him, it's not really him, but he said 98 percent of the time they don't end up doing the show. It, it's not to say, it's not to say they don't get this. You know they get some results. But to actually go on stage, you know, most of them don't, you know, it's very, it's very, very hard. It's a very, very splintered, small percentage of the population that actually goes on stage. Uh, but he said he keeps the fat down by eating correctly, exercising and doing daily cardio. Well, that, well that's smart, obviously. Yeah. And I think Frank is about 71 or 72. But even still, you know, a patient like that, I would try to keep him in the 700 range, 800 range. You know, as far as testosterone goes, you get your you get your average allopath, you know, and they they're they're fine with two fifty. Oh yeah, it, it falls into that normal, but that that's low normal. And oh yeah, there's dysfunction there. Would you agree? Oh yeah, yeah, it shouldn't be that low. That's crazy. Uh, that's definitely suboptimal. I I would consider that to be a, a health condition. Something's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> 
Doc, what do you see uh, most common as far as injuries that people are trying to get around in your practice so they can still train? I would say in this order, lower back, knees, shoulders. Lower back, knee, and shoulder. What's going on with the shoulder usually? Uh, shoulders are, are usually related to one of two things or both, either an acute trauma due to a fall. Uh, so people impact the shoulders with uh, falls or cumulative due to uh, repetitive uh, workloads. So if you have somebody like a, a carpenter that's nailing above his head for 20 years, you know. You so you get some, you get some impingement uh, syndrome there. Um, yeah. Do you see anybody doing presses behind the neck anymore? Not if they want to uh, avoid my scolding. <laughs> All right, let me, ask you, let me ask you about squatting because there, there, there is a, a group out there that, you know, if you don't squat, you shouldn't even train. I say this. I say you've got to look at nothing is like you mentioned absolutes earlier. I don't think there is any. Um, you're drinking water. I'm drinking Diet Mountain Dew. It's Friday hey. night, so I, I treat myself on Friday night. Wild yeah. wow, man. I get a little buzz from it because all week it's water, and then I do this. Um, uh I look at several things with the squat. Number one, when you do an exercise and you're doing it correctly, you should feel it in the target. You should feel the stimulation in the target. You've got to look at pelvic disposition, uh, femur length, knee tracking, and and as far as where are your arches? Are your arches flat? Are they elevated? Are they where they should be? What, what do you think of all, all of those factors as far as whether a person should or could squat or not? Yeah, I tell you, we could have a, an entire episode or series on this topic. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a very broad topic. It is. It is, and it's one that, that I'm passionate about. I'm a yeah. big fan of squatting. Um, and to give you a little little background there, I grew up in that that era around other powerlifters, especially that you know you, you squatted or or nothing. You know, you weren't worth a damn if you're not squatting. So was it one of the, would they would they kick you out if you wouldn't squat? They would embarrass you to the extent that you would leave. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they'd send that girl that that girl that put you down in arm wrestling after you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they 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 go find her, take her out. Yeah, so uh, pretty early on, I found diminishing returns for my given efforts, which were were quite extreme. I was working my ass off, and. You know, my legs weren't responding in kind. I'm sorry to interrupt, but when you say you weren't responding, strength or growth? And what growth. Were you, you were squatting for growth for bodybuilding? Uh, definitely both. But, you know, I needed some size on my legs. I have long femurs, you know, scrawny. Right. Uh, and guys said, hey, you get your squat up, your legs will get big. And those are. Those are comments usually made by guys with big legs. So as a, a young guy, you doc, doc, one second. I'm gonna because we're gonna tie into Frank Ferry. I Frank, correct me if I'm wrong, you're 71 or 72. And he's he's great bodybuilder, but he's suffering sarcopenia. And you're mentioning right here, you're not that old. But even still, let's work that in some sarcopenia and why guys that are older just either lose, there's a nutrition of muscle, they can't build it. Because Frank's mentioning right here, and you're talking about it now. He says, I haven't squatted in five years. I use a squat press and standard leg press instead. High, high, high reps. Yesterday, 270 for 100 reps. So Damn. talk about what you were talking about and then tie that in if you could with sarcopenia. That's important. That's what people want to hear about. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Well, um, I, I spent years in, with uh, frustration and injury uh, with very little to show from it. So uh, I met a, a great physical therapist and really picked his brain for a, a period of uh, several months and uh, learned a lot about biomechanics and leverage as it related to the squat and that not all humans are are uh, going to have equal benefit from that movement. Uh, so I began to apply various strategies to improve my leverages, to throw more stress on the, the target, as you mentioned, and less on my back and knees. And I began to to prosper from it. But the the tool that I found most useful that uh, I would recommend to Frank there is the uh, Zane Leg Blaster. Oh, I love it. Love it. Man, I I can't tell you how much good that's done, not just myself, but more importantly, scores, dozens, hundreds of people I've worked with. i got to ask you this, the obvious, why? 
Because what's, what's what's the difference biomechanically? Because you, you're very you know, very attuned to the nuances of biomechanics. Yeah. So essentially, what you have is a, a variance in the the fulcrum of the the hip and lower back relative to the length of the femur. And not to get overly complicated here, but uh, the leg blaster allows you to automatically adjust that toward an optimal leverage. You can shift your hips accordingly. You can, you can make those movements that you cannot make with a barbell because you'd fall. You'd fall right. forward or back. Uh, and in doing so, it's it's like uh, magic in terms of the reduction in joint pain. And I've, I've had so many folks use it that simply could not squat either due to uh, natural leverages or due to injury or surgeries. I've, I've had a, a number of guys use it with uh, complete knee replacements. Wow. Yeah. And if, if done properly in terms of his question with uh, sarcopenia, you can use light weight and really emphasize the lower range of motion that's going to target the, the muscles around the knee, you know, the VMO, the lower vastus lateralis, the, right. the rectus femoris, all that. Um, that is very difficult to do with the barbell, if not impossible. And uh, most leg presses don't allow the, the proper um, stress, I guess you'd say, in that range of motion. When you lower the platform that far to target the muscle in that stretch position, it's difficult to keep your, your back from rounding, which is a real problem. I've, I've experienced that actually. Two, two statements or slash questions, however you interpret them. Um, do you think that the, the, Zane, the leg blaster also uh, saves your shoulders? Because you know, you know one of the difficult things with the squat, and it's important, people, they, they bypass this, especially if you have shoulder problems like I do, getting your arms back there and being comfortable because if you have pain up here and, you, and you're focusing on here, you're, you're, you're not, you're not oh, man. here. So it's, a, it's almost like it's um, uh, distracting you. I mean, is, uh, if I remember correctly, is the leg blaster, the arms are uh, free. positioned in front, correct? Yeah. The harness, the harness fits comfortably over the chest so that the, the resistance is very close to your center of gravity at the hips not atop your shoulders. Right. It's really not a lot of pressure on your shoulders. It's a really well-designed piece. Frank told me it took a, a number of iterations to get the, the curvature correct on that. And I can understand that. Uh, but, oh man, absolutely. Shoulder pain can be a, a major problem with the squat. I've seen guys, you know, advanced lifters, usually over 40, 50, uh, who approach the bar so begrudgingly, not because of the pain that the squat's gonna cause, but just getting under the bar, you know, they have to hold the plates rather than the bar because they can't get their arms down that far. And would, you, would you agree that the shoulder, I've always maintained any injury is bad, but I've always said probably the worst joint uh, to injure is the shoulder only because it allows probably the highest range of motion. But with all that range of motion, when you lose all of that, yeah. uh, you're at that much of a disadvantage. Yeah, it's tough to work around. It really is. You know, the, the shoulders involved in a majority of movements to some extent. And if you don't believe that, uh, injure them and, and then find out. You'll, well, you'll go it's, it's terrible. And, you know, the funny thing is uh, some of my orthopedic surgeon friends, they've even told me this. I've had a couple of open repairs on my shoulders, uh, two on each. And they always tell you, don't ever again do anything overhead. Uh, they tell you never again because most body, but weightlifters, they go right back within a month and they screw it up again. They really mean a year. You've got to give it a whole year to rest and repair. And then you've got to come back, um, you know, with limitations depending upon the individual. But I want to go back to um, the sarcopenia. Why do you think there is this loss of uh, uh, muscular mass from the legs in the male? And it's important. It's not just cosmetic. There's there's a lot of reasons, health reasons, why you've got to maintain, you know, the the, the hip girdle, the, the, um, the gluteals, the thighs. Uh, wh why is this muscle loss so profound after, let's say, the age of 35 or 40? You know what? Um, Dave Palumbo brought up an excellent point regarding this uh, fairly recently, and I think that there's some merit to it. If you look at folks with uh, pronounced sarcopenia, there is a strong correlation with nerve damage to the extremities. So there may be less efficient firing to those tissues that are causing, you know, basically a, a, a slow necrosis. They're just kind of dying off. You, you know, if you have damage to an area that's going to atrophy. Yes. So I think that's very interesting. Um, 
prior to that theory, my own is what I call the, the Mork for Mork theory. Remember how Mork uh, aged backward, right? Yes. And he became a boy and an egg or whatever. Yeah. Uh, well, I, in the embryo, we kind of form out like that. And it's almost like as we age, we're, we're kind of closing back in toward the center again uh, until you look like a lima bean. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I, I see that. Um, you know, you mentioned to me once, my calves, my calves used to be decent. Now they're, they're scary. In fact, my mother, my mother never says anything bad. Uh, but she did say to me, you know, the last time I was in good shape, maybe two months ago, she was, Michael, you're looking great, but what about your calves? And my mother, who the hell, how can an old lady mention? Brutal. So they must really be glaringly bad. But the point is, you mentioned something you learned, and you associated it with one of the pro bodybuilders. This is what you told you told me this, and he was postulating that he was having the same problem. His thighs were staying nice and developed, but he was losing his calves, and it was because of damage to the lower lumbar nerves from yep. something. Uh, what do you know about that? And, and as far as the potential of that being a reality for someone like me? Well, I tell you what, one factor that I found that that could be uh, related to this and ties in with our, our previous conversation is the stress imposed on that lumbar region from heavy leg presses. It's compressive, it's damaging in, in a cumulative fashion over time. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten off the leg press and felt like my tailbone was itching. You know, the sensation of itching, which is indicative of, of uh, some neuropathy. Uh, there's just no way for me to perform a leg press of any real depth without it placing a, a ton of uh, the flexion of the sacrum. It's just not healthy. Right. So, when you're talking about, you know, when you talk about the sacrum, you're talking about cuneal neuroplexus. Uh, you're talking about some different issues there, uh, which would be associated potentially with some um, uh, attrition of muscles in the lower. I mean, who knows? You, you got to work hard. And speaking of working hard, you told me about some brutal, brutal. Uh, I just couldn't take my uh, bring myself to try some of your leg protocols. Uh, and, and let me. It's time to work in our good friend. Did you learn this from one of your mentors, uh, the late legendary Charles Poliquin? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, Charles was paid and was successful for one reason. He got results. Right. You know, he, he uh, sure as hell wasn't paid for his personality. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, was, what was his special, um, what made him so effective, would you say? Because a lot of people have knowledge. You know, the knowledge is out there to be had. But I, I do know that he would literally learn different languages to learn protocols from different cultures and countries and whatnot. I mean, that's, that's really reaching. It is. Yeah. Yeah. He put in the time that's for sure. So he, he garnered the knowledge first. Okay. That was early in his career. He went to great extents and expense to really develop his knowledge base, uh, possibly to the fullest, uh, that we know of. And then what really gave him success was his analytical approach toward training his clients with those concepts. And what I mean by that was he would set up experiments and very well documented. He recorded everything where he would, he would manipulate precise variables between two different clients on the same protocol and judge, which was more effective and keep extrapolating upon that until he had, you know, very well proven systems. Uh, so he really took it into the lab. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he kind of had a, I don't know if it was a soft spot, but I think he, he maybe wrestled with the idea of trying to antagonize you, but you were just so ripped all the time, right? And did he say something yeah. about that once? Because I've, yeah. I've got a parallel story. I've got this thing with Vince Geronda. Uh, I meet in hell because he, you know, I was a young kid and I, I went to his gym when I was 16 and this story is out there. And he threw me out of, out of the gym because I asked the question. I, you know, he's very acerbic, and I think he, I think his son died, and he was having a very hard time. Maybe it was a bad day. I don't know. Uh, but I wanted to learn from him. You know, it's one of the reasons I went to California. Uh, 
But you know, you had Poliquin and you were you learned from him. And and I think that's very important because now you're almost like a surrogate with what you're doing now. I mean, do you do you, es do you espouse or adhere to many of his tenets or do you not agree with everything that he uh helped? Oh. Well, I tell you, I, I don't even agree with everything that I said a year ago. Oh, okay. yeah, I know that, that's true. I wish I knew now, uh, and I could implement when I was a kid. I, you know, I would have at least been in the magazines more or something. You know. Yeah, that that was another one of uh, Charles' strengths was his flexibility, uh, and he was actually humble about his his knowledge base, and that he would admit when uh, something had changed or was now contradictory or whatever. He he did uh, adapt over time, uh, he was all about optimal results. So if that meant discarding uh, a current tenant in favor of uh, you know new research, he was all for it. Yeah, because you know, guys like that, people are always trying to knock you off and, and you know find these cracks in the edifice. And I'm wrong all the time. I, I just hope that I'm right more than I'm wrong and I don't do any harm. Because when you're out there in the game, you know, you, you can't play scared. I mean, you got to try different things and new things. And like you said, that's the only way you're really going to garner results. A little bit more from Frank Ferry. Uh, he says, okay, so his squat press has an adjustable backrest, and it seems to act just like a squat. I only go to 90 degrees on either press, uh, not only from squatting, but from a couple of motorcycle accidents. Mick is that. So Frank's, you know, Frank is older. He's 72. And just by mm -hmm. like virtue of being on this planet long enough, He's got degeneration. Uh, he may have uh, some bone spurs uh, uh, interfering with the, the foramen where the nerves come out. So, you know, he could have some nerve involvement without injury, uh, without frank injury, just from degeneration. Oh, yeah. uh, and, you know, that's something to consider because even if you live an innocuous lifestyle, just by being a human and being exposed to the pressure of the atmosphere, you're going to have breakdown over time, especially if you live long enough. And that's why I say, you know, you can still – you know, do all the things you did when you were younger, just with different uh, allowances. You do them differently. You do them immediately. Uh, you, 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 you get around them, which is what you do with your clients and patients. You get them to do these same things to affect, you know, hopefully the same growth collaterally, but you have to have them do it in a different way. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. It, it's just laziness for a person to, to throw up their hands and say, well, I can't do that anymore. You know, I can't train anymore because of the pain. That's bullshit. There's always a way to work around it, to, to find a solution to the issue. If you can walk into my office, I can find a way for you to train. You know, it, it's were, you, were you were you telling me about Steve Davis's, you know, the former Mr. World, uh, his old workout where it's 10 sets of 10 reps and between each, uh, it was just, Utterly insane, which reminds me of what Evan, and then I'll lead to the question for you. What reminds me of what Evan said to Pawnee said to me. He said, Listen, Mike, when you when you're squatting and it's terrible and it's killing you, and you want to vomit and you stop and you're laying on the floor, you should be thinking of the next thing, which is even harder than that. You should be you should be attempting the hardest things that you hate to facilitate adaptation which is what you want, which I think is what Steve did. And I think you did that too. I mean, I'd have to throw myself into the fire, but that's what has to be done. Is that true? Oh man, if you're gonna push your limits in terms of growth, if you wanna approach your potential, it ain't gonna come easy. You know, I, I really respect people like Steve Davis and John Defendus. To me, those guys came as close as possible to achieving their fullest potential. You know, they, they took it to the to the level that bordered on insanity. You know, you had to push through things that just uh, weren't really human. I have to ask you this, and this is an important question. How do you meter, you as an individual, because you really can't do this for your clients, when you say pushing uh, to the limit, um, how do you know when to draw back when you're on the cusp of injuring yourself? Because it happens, you know. Like yeah. you look, you look at Jay Cutler. He's talking about Ronnie Coleman. I love Ronnie, but look at Ronnie now. Look what he's done to himself. He's on a walker right now. He's he's on opioids all day. And you and I both know we've talked about this patience. The young guys say, yeah, you know, I'm going to do more and more. 
they've never experienced chronic pain, which will change wear wear you down like a mortar and pestle, um, uh, change your personality, uh, totally change the whole game. But then you got Jay Cutler, and you know I was watching one of the uh, Generation Iron movies, and Jay was saying, and respectfully, he says, "I like Ronnie, but Ronnie trained wrong." Uh, you know, Jay was never injured because he knew when to draw back. And I always use this as an example. I'd like to see if you agree. A guy like Ronnie, uh, juxtaposing him with um, Kai Green. Kai Green probably was natural at the beginning when he didn't look like it because he was just a specimen. Same thing with Ronnie. I think Ronnie's first Olympia probably wasn't on anything. And I think yeah. that's when he looked the best, by the way. That's just me. Yeah. But but, you know, Ronnie got to the point where he was doing 800 in contest shape, three reps, and his whole thing, to this day, I only wish I could do five. The law of diminishing demands, Dr. Whitten, uh, uh, diminishing returns. Um, would you say that he'd get the same effect just going up to 600 and, and taking it easy on his joints but still getting the stimulation in the muscle? You know, that yeah, I mean, yeah, I, mean I, would, I would never question the man's methods, certainly not his success, but I – I would postulate that there is more than one way to skin a cat. And when you're, when you're going for maximum overload, progressive resistance is, is just one uh, of the variables that you can address. It's the, the foremost, you always want to get stronger, right? But at some point, like you said, diminishing returns demand that you expand your training horizons a bit. Uh, Ronnie was such a freak that he undoubtedly could have benefited from safer protocols. You know, it's not like he'd be compromising his growth, but he had that powerlifting mindset, which I can totally identify with, uh, that told him the only way was to use heavier and heavier weights. And are you really going to benefit an additional 20% from going from six to 800? No way. You know, it's going to be 2%. So, and yet, and yet the injury potential skyrockets. So if he were to train more like Jay did, you know, you're talking, you're talking about in that bracket, when you get up there, oh you're my going God. To a whole new coefficient of, you know, risk of injury. Absolutely, man. Yeah. There's so many micro variables that most of us aren't even aware of when you're handling those weights. It's not just as simple as, okay, keep my, my core tight, be mindful of my knee pattern. There's a thousand cues that have to be followed perfectly in the right order in order to execute a lift of that nature without getting seriously hurt. So you're not, you can't really focus on the muscle. It's not, it's not about, you know, Hey, let that's, me. That's, the, that, that's the interesting point. You know, when you're moving that weight, uh, who was saying it? Uh, one of the guys I was working with recently, I might've been Zane. It might've been Bill Grant. You got to ask yourself when you go in the gym, are you a mover of weight or are you a person who's looking to work the muscle? And there's a big difference right there. And I, I do agree. I think, you know, Ronnie loved what he did and he'd probably do it again. Love, 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 love. He didn't, he yeah. wanted to stay a, a cop after he won the Olympia twice because he loved being a cop. He can't argue. I don't think he can argue with that at all because that's the end all right there. He just loves it. Yeah. The rest is, is, is uh, not a factor. Uh, but you know, you see people all the time, you see these kids curling, you know, 120 pounds, which is a lot, and they're swinging it. So they end up with these big. It's like a, it's like a tootsie pop. They have these big. You know, uh, Gordon Falsetti really explained this nicely because he's in the gym all day, and I'm I'm there with my 20s and my 25s. You know, hey, Dave Draper at this point can only, can't do anything higher than a 10 pound dumbbell because of his shoulders, and he's still doing things. I want to keep going, so the weight doesn't matter anymore, but. But, you know, they're going so heavy and all this swinging, they're bypassing the bicep. They're work so they end up with this big developed deltoid and no arms. You know, it's amazing. They can move all this weight and there's no development. Do you think that's because they're bypassing the muscle? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Here's the, uh, the caveat that I give guys when it comes to adding resistance. It's a simple question, but it makes them think. I ask them, well, adding that weight – place more stress upon the target muscle. And of course they'll quickly say, yeah, yeah, of course it will. Really? If you add 20 pounds to that bar, are you gonna be able to execute it in the same form that you just did and provide the same stress to that muscle or are you gonna involve the shoulders, the back, whatever? If you can honestly answer yes, okay, we can go up and wait. But quite often it, that's not the case. So 
adding weight, uh, you know, Ronnie, Ronnie's success was uh, also his, his undoing, I think, in that he had such great success with the heavy, heavy weights that it was hard for him to, you know, to step away from that and, and uh, attempt other means of achieving that end. Uh, but to, to uh, address your, your earlier question before I forget, um, I had some really good advice uh, a number of years ago from a guy who's about 20 years my senior, a uh, very good lifter. And he said, yeah, oh, an, an old guy like me in my bracket, maybe older man. Well, I don't like to listen. I don't like, they tell me I'm ready. You know, I'm 56. So I'm ready for senior living. I'm like, what the fuck? fuck that. Don't, be that, don't be putting that on me. I'm not going Get there. Here. Come on. Get out of here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, this guy uh, has maintained a good physique. He's, he's, he's had his share of uh, injuries and troubles, which makes me respect him even more. And he said a general rule of thumb that I should practice if I want to keep this up, you know, ad infinitum is leave one rep in the tank on compound lifts. So always leave it where you can do one more rep and don't do it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Good rule, good rule of thumb. You follow that? Yeah, because, you know, that, that takes a lot of self-discipline initially because you want to go, you know, you want to push all you got. And it, it takes more discipline to hold back than to go for it, actually. It yeah. takes 30, but it's that last rep where things go wrong. You know, you typically get hurt when, as Mincer explained it on that last rep, you're truly expending 100% of your, of your fibers. And that's when things break. It's like, if you red light a car, your car is going to blow up. If you have it floored versus putting around, you know, the engine's not going to last as long. So on, on your big compound lifts, especially the squat, especially the deadlift, don't approach failure on those, man. It doesn't you know, you know, Evan, Evan says the same thing. He says, look, you know, people don't get to those last two reps, the intensity factor. Those are the two that give you the new ab adaptation. So you get, you know, a few extra muscle fibers that give you a little bit more shape and size over time. They stop before they get there. And that's right there. You know, like we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. you know, the mindset's not there. You know, now, they're not if you have there. They're not feeling it in the target. You know, they're moving the weight, but they're not getting the effect. Yeah, and if you're using an isolation movement, especially machine or cable, by all means, man, go all out, you know, in good form. Push it as hard as you can, squeeze it, because that's what you're doing. You're targeting the muscle in isolation. But in a compound lift, you're dealing with multiple joints that have to act in unison. And there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong in that, in that circumstance. But if I'm doing a, a push down with a rope handle, yeah, I can take it all the way till I can't complete another rep safely. That's that's cool. But if you load, you know, like in my case, I'd have to have, I don't know, 500 plus pounds on the squat to, to go to failure, you know, for five, five or less reps. And man, that's dangerous. That's, that's oh, yeah. that, that doesn't make sense. No, not a good. Doctor, doctor, what, are you, what are you doing now for training since the gym is not open? Uh, I'm impervious, man. <laughs> I like that word. I've got a home gym. I, I oh, got do you? Oh, yeah. Well prepared. <laughs> I'm oh, just yeah. Getting, I'm just getting ready to build a complex here and the whole – and everything, you know, the business got trashed. You know, I take it all with equanimity because I just delivered myself back to when I lived in the Y, and it was a short period of time. But, you know, it's one of those things. They take your possessions. You get a bed. You know, this is a long time ago when I was down and out. Uh, so, you know, I'll be back and whatnot, but it, it, it's, listen, it, it's the further a field I get from not training, the worse I feel, uh, especially when the body cries with regularity and it's used to certain things. And then you no longer give it to the body. And it's, it's like, a, I'm a stranger in a strange land as far as his body goes right now. So you're staying pretty lean. You're staying in good shape. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm in good shape. I, uh, you know, it's almost, uh, subconscious or autonomic now that, I uh, lean down in the summer because I've competed for so many years where the, the shows, you know, they've ramped up in the summer and, right. and in the fall. So I, I don't know if it's just uh, always lurking in the back of my head or whatever, but I begin to make changes subconsciously starting about April, you know, to type. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, when do you peak? I like to peak uh, like you do around my birthday, maybe a little bit later. Yeah. That's a great listen. You know, I, I suggest that for a lot of people now. So many people had their contests canceled. Maybe just peak on your birthday. You know, uh, yeah. to me, I look forward to my birthday because I try to look better every year on my birthday. 
I'm with you, man. Those photos go a long way. Oh man, you know Zane told me, you know, I take you know for the best mediocre bodybuilder, I have like a huge archive of photos. And he, but he said, he said, listen, you know, the only thing I have to prove, I was who I was, was photos. And when I was writing for the magazines for a while, I, I was helping some uh, high-level amateur bodybuilders, and I'd say, bring your portfolio, and they'd have a photo that their mother took from the 30th row with the thumb over the. Thing. I said, listen, why are you doing this, man? You, you, you're not. You got to get in the groove. You, you got to know why you're doing this because. You, Eventually, you're going to be telling fish stories because your body's not going to look like that forever. Yeah. Got to have those photos. Let me ask you a question: Who do you? Uh, is, who was the best bodybuilder ever? Lee Haney. Haney. I would say overall, Lee Haney. Yeah, I mean that's a question that's that's of course difficult to pose because there's no pun intended, but uh, because there's so many attributes to a champion. But uh, I think Lee Haney had the most balanced, aesthetic, massive. And just beautiful physique. Uh, I was lucky enough to meet him when I was a, a teenager, and he was still in his prime. And uh, he was very kind to me. You met him when he was a teenager, really? When I was a teenager. Oh, when you were a teenager. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that, must, that must have been really uh, fantastic. It helped. Oh my God. Yeah. You know what? I I drove down to Animal Kingdom in Atlanta. Oh right. And I just hung around because that's just went there. That's what I do, man. I like you, man. I, I do that type of stuff too. Yeah. I just show up. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. I'll just I'll just hang out. You know, I was having a great time training and a couple of days went by and and he kind of ambled in there, you know, and there's no mistaking <laughs> Mr. Haney. And uh, I just got the, the guts up to go up and introduce myself. And he was incredibly laid back and uh, spent some time with me just for nothing. So you know? he, he lent himself to considerable discourse with you. He just started talking. Yeah. yeah, it was awesome. You know, he had no reason to do that. Uh, uh, he took me into his little posing room and and uh, looked wow. at me. And, yeah. And then the guy, the guy, he buys me a, uh, a protein drink at his juice bar. Did he? Told him to give me, you know, what I wanted. That is so cool. Yeah. That is so cool. Uh, so I'm obviously biased a little bit, but I really do think just in terms of physique that, that Haney was uh, the epitome of, of, of excellence. I agree. And, you know, it's funny because Zane, the last time he competed in the Olympian, Zane was a small, you know, he, he won the Olympia at 190. Um, and uh, the last time he competed, I think, was 2003. And that's when Haney came on the scene. And he looked at Haney and he said, I'm done because this is a shift to a bigger size. But still, not the shift of uh, Yates and no. Coleman. So kind of like more still acceptable. Uh, so I agree with you. I, I always say it's probably Haney. You know, his arms are probably a little lacking in the peak. But you're not – listen, you're going to – nothing's going to be perfect. Uh, plus, he's a, a, you, know, you know what goes a long way is being nice. All that stuff he did with you, you know. That's what it's all about. Why are you doing all this if you can't affect change in people around you when you think about it, right? Uh huh. Yeah, and if I had to pick one singular image, a, a photograph that is my favorite of all time, it would be one of uh, Steve Davis. That's that's well known, uh, where he's he's hitting a classic overhead. Oh uh, yeah, I just I just posted that. Oh, Steve Davis doing one of these things. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's on my timeline. A couple of pick uh, a couple of days down. Oh yeah. Man, that's tough to beat. No, Steve Davis never got the props that he deserved, you know, he, he was did. around when Zane was there and he was kind of Zane light, I guess, you know, yeah, uh, he was a taller Zane. He was, yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, uh, by the way, Frank, um, Dr. Aaron it will be 46 in July. He asked your age. Um, and Frank says he met Lee at the masters Olympia in Miami. Great guy. We talked for like 20 minutes and you know, who's also like that Jay Cutler. Why is Jay Cutler still successful in business? Years after he's competed, still thriving, everything he sends out, he autographs. He answers every email. Everybody yeah. matters, you know, and he's mindful of that. And that goes a long way. You start getting that air about you. Um, I, I worked with a former Miss Olympia from a long time ago. She wanted me to help her. And I looked at her page, and she would put up a, a post, 300 responses. And these people, you know, that's their hero in some ways. And she wouldn't respond to anybody. She would act like they were ghosts. So I'd ask her, I go, why are you putting that up there? Oh, I don't have any time. I go, you know, 
that girl might be on the verge of killing herself and you yeah. responding might deliver. And she got kind of like, she got kind of mad with me. Like, who the hell am I? I'm like, well, I'm a guy who knows how to make money. You know, if that's yeah. what you're trying to do, but you know, but that notwithstanding, uh, I think that goes a long way, you know, lifting other people and, and, you know, they don't have to worry because nobody's going to be as good as Jay, anybody he helps, he's not going to be threatened. The same thing with Haney and look at you, you're talking about this many years later. You're still talking about it right now. It affected you like that. And that's what it's all about. I've got a list to present to you, my friend, that we always do at the end. And you're going to give me, uh, you know, uh, some some thoughts upon each name. And you could say, you know, listen, free speech. <laughs> so, okay, number one is Arnold. All right. Uh, first word that pops into my mind, <laughs> womanizer. Yeah. And I'll back that up. Uh, I met him. I've met him a few times. And I was, at, yeah, I was at the Arnold one year with a, a girlfriend. I saw he's actually uh, speaking to me. We're having a little bit of conversation going, which is kind of hard to do with the man, uh, you know, with his stature these days or those yeah. days. Um, and everything was going fine. And then I can tell that he's not listening to a word I say, and he's looking beyond me. Really? And, uh, my, my girlfriend walks up and he literally nudges me out of the way, puts his arm around her, leans in and starts talking to her, like whispering in her ear. I'm like, what the hell? This guy, man, how is he not? Well, now he has suffered the consequences of that. Uh, my God, what a weakness. Uh, well, listen, you know, I'm going to tell you, let me, let me ask you when he did that, could you, could have you taken him down one shot? Oh, not that you would have done that. It's kind of a stupid question, but, you know, listen. Yeah, well, it, it, that would be hitting an old man. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, let if, me, if, you, if you hit a senior citizen, it's a felony. Just understand that. And he went over 55. So. Let, me, let me tell you one other thing about him to make up for that, because I don't like to spread negativity. Uh, he really, he really uh, boosted my ego. Uh, the first time I met him, I was, I was bigger. I was about 250 pounds and, you know, he uh he said you were, you were 250 yeah wow. yeah yeah so he uh he remarked hey he said you're a big guy and uh he felt my my arm and uh he said wow <laughs> no kidding. that's cool yeah that's and really uh cool. i thought okay i can probably die happily as a body <laughs> even, if, even if arnold's 99 percent full of shit at least he's you a know, <laughs> yeah right you know, I'm in a universe. Yeah, I I understand that because as a kid, I bought Education of a Bodybuilder when I was 14, and I grew up like reading all his stories when he was a kid, and you almost have like this kinship. And all of a sudden, you meet him years later, and you're sharing this space with him, and he's considering you. And I think that's really big and impactful, and it gives you fuel to go oh, out. Yeah. You know, I yeah. I, I understand that. And I think it's I think it's very relevant. There's a gym owner up here. He's very famous. He threatened to beat me up when I was down in Florida because he lives down there part time. It doesn't matter who it is. You can probably figure it out. So he comes on here and, you know, I've got one of my comparisons of me and Frank Zane. And then I had a comparison of me and Samir Banu one day. And then I had maybe a comparison of me and Arnold because, frankly, I have better abs than Arnold, which isn't saying much. That wasn't a strong point. I but, agree. But, but, but the point the point is. I do that because how do you push yourself? And he comes on and goes, who the hell do you think you are? You're nothing comparing yourself. So I said, you know, you sound like a fraud to me. What do you mean? I own this famous gym for 40 years, blah, blah, blah. And it is. It's very renowned. I go, well, why are you in business? He goes, what do you mean? I go, aren't you in the business of getting people in shape? He goes, yeah. I go, well, do you have any pictures of the former pros on the walls? He goes, yeah. I go, why? And he really didn't quite get it. I go, people are aspiring to do the same thing. Now, there is no, I already know that I'm not a pro. I'm not an Olympian, I'm nothing. You know, I'm happy with myself. But you've got you've to gotta pursue what can possibly be as far as humans go. That's how I look at it. So I said to him, I go, so if you're saying all these people joining your gym are not going to amount to anything more than Michael Joe Dusa, you know, you're just taking their money and you're running. So I you're to right. me, it sound like a 40-year fraud running. Oh, and he, he saw the truth in it. 
got mad and he said, I'm going to meet you at the, I go, well, listen, we're not going to meet anywhere. I'm down here at Disney with my girl. And, but, you know, that was kind of funny. Uh, on, uh, the, next, the, next, the next number, we've talked about them, but your general overall impactful thought, Charles Poliquin. Teacher. Yeah, that, that's the first word that comes to mind, teacher. Uh, he taught me a great deal. Uh, I have tremendous respect for the man. He, uh, and he, he was not easy to, uh, to like or even learn from. You had to earn it. And he used that, that phrase to apply to several things, uh, most famously about carbohydrate. You had to earn your carbs. I love that. I love that. <laughs> you, you can say that to almost anybody. What do you think? You know, I, I was uh, I was standing beside him once when a knucklehead came up and asked him a, a very pointed question. Uh, Hi, Jim. Sorry. Got a yeah, couple he, of this. Yeah, I just shout out. Uh, he this guy just uh, kind of rudely addressed Charles and, and asked him a pointed question about a, a strength training protocol. And uh, that's just not how you would approach the man. You 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 had to develop some rapport and oh. protect you. And he tore this guy a new one. You know he he asked him how old he was first. You, you know you're in deep shit when the guy's calm. You know before he tears into you. <laughs> you know you know what this reminds me of. I used to watch Seinfeld and um uh, the Soup Nazi. And if, oh, you, yeah. if you didn't if you didn't stand in the right place if you didn't order properly. No soup. You know, that's what you no. tell me right now. It sounded like you're approaching the soup Nazi kind of, and if you don't do it right, yeah. You know, if you're watching from the side, you're like, oh, yeah. Boy. <laughs> yeah. So he uh, he just calmly asked him how old he was, and he said something like 25. And uh, he said, "Do you realize that uh, I've invested more years than that in expanding my own knowledge base? The great lengths that I went to." Uh, you know, the, the trouble, the expense, the blood, the tears, everything to gain that knowledge. And now you expect me to just give it up freely because you have a whim and you undoubtedly will not even heed my advice because you're not a man of respect or courtesy. Absolutely. Perfect. You know, you know you, you, he can dig it. He can see what that guy's all about. He's probably yeah. seen it many times. And you know what? His only disappointment in his head Paul Poliquin, he might be thinking, how did I attract that guy? You know, how did he get through my, my barrier? Because, you know, I would know better. You know, I look at him as one of the, you know, he occupies the pantheon of all-time greats in the strength uh, field. Would you agree? I mean, he's one of the top. Oh, oh absolutely, yeah. And it's funny you mentioned that because uh, he turned to his, his uh, admin guy after that who handled all the, you know, processing of, of fees for the seminars and whatnot and said, how did that fucking guy get in here? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to be the ad guy right there, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I was watching Robert Downey Jr., Iron Man, and he's they're asking him such idiotic questions, and you can see him getting mad. And he looked at his manager or his agent, and he said, how the hell did I end up here? So, uh, because, you know, it's not like softball questions, but you got to stay on message, on purpose, on point to deliver yeah. – salient information to people and you get these people that just you know what they waste time we had a guy like that in in, in school and he would always ask these questions just ask questions and to me i'm like you're, you're wasting our time this is not yeah. about you at all uh number four uh, number three first michael hearn yeah you know i've never met the man but uh you know like everyone i've seen him in the magazines for decades and uh you know, I competed in uh, tested bodybuilding, and Mike was actually in that same organization for some time. And so, of course, I was uh, inundated with uh, the common insults directed toward him, you know, that he's not natural, yada, yada, yada. And uh, here's what I prefer to take away from that situation. Uh, you can either approach a, a person or a situation with – negativity or, or openness. Now, if you, if you initiate the conversation with negativity by saying, oh, he's a fucking liar, you know, he's full of shit. Okay. You have just now negated any chance of learning from this person or this situation. Right. You can go into it with an open mind, which I choose to do and say, 
hey, this guy has looked really good for a really long time. He obviously knows something. Right. Benefit from this man's knowledge. Why do I have to judge him based on something that I, I will never know if it's true, nor do yeah. I care. But, you know, if, if I had a chance to sit down and have a beer with the guy, damn right, I would. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I, I look at things like, uh, number one, if you're not present to watch the needle meet the ass cheek, yeah. forgive me for the graphics, you don't know. Like people talk about Steve Reeves, God bless him, but, you know, steroids, I'm sorry, injectable testosterone was available back then. You'll never know. You'll never, ever know. I, it's a lovely romantic thing to think about the hero never, but you know, you're not going to know and it doesn't matter. It's not relevant. But I look at a guy like O'Hearn, he's consistent over time for many, 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 many years. And that whole drug conundrum, when you're doing it wrong, it's usually this vacillating, yeah. fat, skinny injuries, you come and you go, um, you know, the list goes on and on. So O'Hearn, yeah. Uh, I'm going to skip number four for now, but number five, we touched upon him. Ronnie Coleman, final thought. He's sincere. I think Ronnie is the real deal. I, I got to have uh, lunch with him and, and spend some time with him. And the, the guy was just as down to earth as possible. He was, he was, uh, he was very cool. He was just laid back, man. He's got that Southern demeanor and he was. Doctor, doc, did you, did you see him in Ronnie Coleman, the King? Yeah, I did. Yeah, wasn't that good? Yeah, it was, you know, and it's, it's, it's hard to see what's happened to him, uh, to see a man, you know, send that, that quickly, relatively, it's really hard, especially when he's known for his physicality. Right. I, I, like you said, I don't think he regrets it. And I think that he's, he's sincerely happy, if not pain free. And, uh, I hope that he graces the earth for a, a great many years to come. He's going to need to, to pay for all those kids. Do you see that? He's got a so, gap. I think he's got eight daughters. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Ronnie, just to echo what you're saying, and I'll, I'll again, I'll lend some platitudes here. I'm glad you exist. I'm glad you're part of my universe here, and you 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 add a lot of good here all the time. And we got pe people who appreciate it, and a guy like Ronnie too. He shows what the human the human entity can can achieve. I mean, he was at the zenith, and we need to see that. We need to have that. And I hope he's here as long as he can be. And finally, uh, number five, cats versus dogs. Which are better? <laughs> well, I get. I should ask Gordon Falsetti this because he's a cat guy too. Yeah, and you know what? Gordon has. Uh, Whoa! Here we go. We got a visitor. Cameo appearance. I hope. I hope that. I hope. I hope she's got her Screen Actors Guild card. <laughs> Gordon has a cat that's a spitting image of this guy. I mean, they look like they could be twins. It's funny. Uh, I love animals, man. I, I, I grew up in a very animal-loving household. My dad was a, a conservation agent. Uh, yeah, so grew up to really respect and love animals. And uh, the first word I ever spoke, which will answer your question, uh, the first word to come out of my mouth was kitty. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I'm a cat lover, uh, but I also had a wonderful chihuahua for 19 years. Wow. But, uh, yeah. Loved her dearly. And, uh, you know, it still still impacts me. Uh, yeah, Fozzie's 20 and uh, he was going through a rough patch. Well, we got him. We got him uh, stable now. So uh, look, the, vet, the vet said, look, I, I've said this. I, when I die, my DNA dies. I didn't have any kids. You know, hopefully. Denise keeps me around because she's the one. Uh, but so he's like my son. And somebody said, I'll just put him down. I go, I will Get kill you. Yeah. Um, the vet said, listen, if he's peeing, pooping, eating, and drinking, he enjoys his life and he's doing all that. So I'll maintain that. Make sure he's healthy. Keep him around. Because just like you, I'm sure years from now, I live in the moment now because years from now, I'll be wistful and thinking of him and wishing he was here. Yeah, so, I, so my friend, I want to thank you. Any parting thoughts for the people and all the information we went back and forth on? Just a summation, a summary statement. Well, you know, Frank Zane said something that uh, really resonated with me. He said, at, at my age, my body hurts if I don't train and my body hurts if I do train. <laughs> so I, I choose to train. 
And, you know, as a person with some, some chronic pain issues, you can certainly attest to that, that even if, if at, during this layoff, for instance, uh, the pain remains. Yes. Most, well, let's just say everybody for the sake of argument, everybody over the age of 50 has got some aches and pains, you know, oh, yeah. miles on the chest. So don't let that ever dissuade you from improving upon your physical self. There are ways to uh, not only work around, but uh, uh, do the job better. And often you can open your, your mind and broaden your horizons and find out that, hey, maybe I should have been doing it this way all along. You know, maybe this is a better way. That's a big point because, you know, when I was working with Evan uh, and I, you know, I, again, I started in 75 with the home weight set. So what's that? Uh, 45 years. Oh, my God. Ah. And, you know, and this, was, this was a few years ago. I, I got with Evan and he started. We started working. I was in really bad shape. And um, and I, I don't give the reasons I was injured, but it doesn't matter. And I, so we were going over stuff and he, I said, man, I've been doing everything wrong for a long time. He's very diplomatic. He said, well, let's just say you're going to start doing them differently. You yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And I would encourage uh, our, our uh, fellow members here to purchase Doug Brignoli's book. The physics Oh yeah. I'm, Doug's on next month. Uh, oh. Phys uh, physics of fitness. That one. Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. I got him right over there on my shelf. Wow. Really yeah. good. Really the guy's good. Top notch. And uh, obviously he knows longevity. I mean, look at him. He's amazing. Yeah. But, uh, his, his methodology, his principles, um, really espouse safe and effective training. And it's yeah. usually the opposite of hoisting, you know, tremendous poundages. Being a crazy beefy hoister, like we call him. And my whole philosophy, <laughs> I love it. Listen, I love everyone. I already had the guy recently on, on the internet he's, uh, uh, email, I'm going to break you in two when I see you at the Arnold Classic. I go, well, I don't go to the Arnold Classic. And wow. I said, and then I said, there'll be two of me. So you don't want that. But, but, you know, so I, I cast these barbs here and there. <laughs> I don't have, I don't have anybody that I don't like that I could think of. Uh, but um, well, I can tell you, I, I, throughout my career, I haven't really fit in well with either crowd because among the power lifters, you know, I'm the odd bodybuilder. Oh boy. <laughs> you know, that's, like a, that's like a Bob Hoffman thing, you know. You're you're just kind of put in a corner because it's a monetary thing, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. Well, you know, I'm the pretty boy, and God, yeah. anyone who thinks that I'm pretty, but uh, <laughs> and I've told him that before. I said, you know, that says a lot about you if you think I'm pretty. God. <laughs> but then among the uh, the bodybuilders, I'm a bit of an outcast because I don't associate with with 99 of them. Uh, would, and, would you say you're, would you say you're more old school? Whatever that means. Would oh, you say? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I I really prefer that that era overall and, and the mindset that accompanied it. So when it comes to getting decked out in the latest gear and coming into the gym with your gallon water jug, oh boy. Yeah. it's emblazoned with whatever supplement company is supposedly sponsoring you. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've got the massive headphones on. Oh, and, man. You're too cool to even acknowledge anyone else, dude. I'm the furthest thing from that, you know. <laughs> uh, so it it kind of makes people nervous, you know. They they embrace these stereotypes out of insecurity. Absolutely, they can't form their own identity. They have to cling. Uh, so when I walk in, you know, wearing God knows what. <laughs> And, and, and uh, the first thing I do is make the round, shaking hands, talking to people because I like to I like to socialize before I get down to business, you know, and uh, I'm very different in the gym. Yeah, I train intensely, but I also I'm foremost there because I enjoy it. And right. so guys, so many guys look like they fucking hate what they're doing. Hate you know? it, hate it. They look like rank and file, they look like rank and file members of the Baton Death March, like they're going to die, you know, yeah. and they got a hood and they're mad. Yeah. And they're and they and they you know listen. I got young guys giving me the elbow and shit. I'm like, are you kidding me? My God, uh, oh. I'm not gonna fight you, but where's the respect? I mean, uh, even just mutual respect. Uh, but but going back to you, know, you got to get a cell phone jammer. They're about as illegal as a radar detector. And one of my old patients gave me a radar uh, cell phone jammer. I used to use it at the university. Oh, I push a button. It looks like a cell phone. You push a button. Turns off everybody's phone for about 300 yard, a 300 foot radius. Hey, 
Turn them all off in the gym, and you'll have peace and tranquility. And my idea, my friend, of longevity, finally, is you live your life well. You you cultivate a bed of uh, contentment, not happiness, because that's going to come and go. If you think you're happy every day, that means you're smoking meth or something, because you're not. You can't be. You cultivate a bed of contentment where you can live well and you have these ups and downs but your life is pretty much unimpeded by nonsense or or ill health and you make it to whatever age and then you die peacefully in your sleep but you live well the whole time and that's longevity you don't expect to become all busted up and arthritic and you know uh using a walker you got to use that that little cart at walmart you're going to bring that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy so i think it's right here yeah, you got to live well and die fast, ideally. <laughs> you know? I like I, well, folks, yeah. you know, uh, Dr. Dr. Whitney, you can, you can find him any day on some of my pages here and on his own page. He has a great page, uh, Optimize, uh, what's it called? Optimize Human Potential. Great, great, great articles. He puts a lot of time into them. Go to his page and find that and, and join that. It's all free, of course. He is the top guy in lifestyle medicine in his area right now. Does a lot of tele- telemedicine, and you can contact him. Just send him a note. Say hello. See if he offers something you need. Uh, it's a a r o n at w h i t t e n dot com. Aaron at witten dot com, or yep. just contact me if you got to get a hold. It's easy. Come on, pixels are done in a heartbeat. We could, you know, we could bring people together just like that. Uh, yep. And as far as I'm concerned, all of these videos are going on my YouTube channel, uh, MTFU Longevity. Go there and subscribe. Uh, it's building very nicely. And I'm going to put all these guys. I'm going to do a nice thumbnail here, uh, Aaron. I'm going to use some pictures of you. And probably use that bicep that you sent me. I, I didn't forget that. I'm going to use it. But I want to thank you. You have a good weekend, man. And we'll talk some more. I'll have you back on for sure. Yeah, this is fun, man. I'd like to bring you on with like um, maybe Brignoli or somebody. Maybe maybe when when Brignoli comes back, I could have you and him because you guys are kind of like the same vein of thought, you know. Yeah, I'd be honored. I would be honored. Yeah, he, he's a good guy. And one quick story with him, you know, he went to the Mr. California and he was 180 pounds and he went backstage. I guess it was like 1980. Gigantic guys. They literally said to him, "Hey, the pool is down the hall." A swimmer. So he takes it off, and he ended up beating that guy who was, like, really big. And to this day, he's like his foe because of that. So, you know, you never, you never know. You never no. – you know, I've, I've noticed at contests, the guy that usually wins is usually the nondescript guy that you didn't notice. You ever notice that? Oh, yeah, man. I, I, did, a, I did a show in 2010 where there was one older gentleman, silver hair, who just sat in his, uh, like, jogging suit – in the corner in a fold up chair that he had brought. He literally didn't move. He just sat there. And I, I thought maybe he's got someone in the show that he's watching backstage. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, then, uh, you know, they started calling out different classes and uh, he stands up and kind of dramatically pulls the zipper down on that, that sweat suit that he had on. Guy was shredded, dude. He looked fantastic. He was about 150 pounds of granite. That's awesome. Man, it was. He didn't touch a weight. He he just didn't even such good just such just such good shape. Just a couple of flexes, you're pumped. Yeah, man. I, I've had that a couple of times in my life, maybe fleeting hour or two. Uh, this guy, did, he, did, he, did he win? Hell yeah, he dominated the Masters. Uh, this guy, his name was Tomas. He was from Spain. This was at the uh, Mister International. And this guy not only won, but he he crushed the psyche of the rest of us by having his gorgeous wife pull around in a rented Ferrari to pick him up after the show. <laughs> she looked like a friggin' supermodel. She was about 20 years younger than him. Tall, had the high heels, black dress, all this going on. I'm like, God, what just happened? <laughs> I'm impactful because we're talking about it now many years later. Oh yeah. I love that guy. I love that guy. You know, he, he had it down to an art. Mental warfare. You know, yeah. it's done in the mind, just like Sergio, the first time against Arnold, he took that, that cloak off and Arnold like knew right there that he was done. Yeah. We were all frantically pumping, you know, and applying touch up and whatnot. He's just sitting back there chilling, 
looking at all of us, surveying our weak points, and then just got up and pretty much should have just accepted his damn trophy at that point because everybody was up, you know, thrown off their game when he he uh, stepped into the lineup. Didn't even know the guy was in the damn show, and he looked amazing. You know, just a standing- master, a master of right. dissecting. Um, you know, like Arnold said, he wanted to see everybody's. When he went in the eighty Olympia, nobody knew it. He was looking forward to seeing a bunch of guys in all their dreams for years and years crumble before their eyes, and they'd get sick like they'd have to go to the bathroom and vomit when they saw him. That's <laughs> you know that kind of falls in tandem with him screwing the maid on his wife's bed. You could see that like in the same the same chamber yeah. in his brain. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. That's a bit of a dark one there. Hey, hey, listen, Doc. It's been a lot of fun. I got to go downstairs to see what's going on. Everybody in the house might right now might be kung fu fighting or some crazy shit. I've been locked up here all, so we got to check it out. Uh, but thanks again, man. We'll talk real soon. Yeah. And everybody, remember. Um, uh, Aaron at Witten.com, A-A-R-O-N at W-H-I-T-T-E-N.com, your lifestyle medicine professional. He's a good guy, and he can help you out. And, hey, thanks again there, Doc. Hey, thank you. My honor. All right, man. We'll talk soon. Take, Take care. care. All right.